Now we would like to invite you to the opening of the exhibition in the common room and to have a coffee break all together. Please join us. Morning. Um, my name is Ramzi Mabsoud. I'm the chair of the economics department. Um, I'm here to uh, introduce Professor Talib, who's joining us uh, from New York. So um, on the occasion of the 150 years of AUB and FAS, the work of Professor Talib offers the idea of anti-fragile systems. That is systems which embrace randomness to flourish. Clearly, AUB, having not merely survived but prospered uh, from so many traumatic uh, events, including different rulers, a bloody civil war, and regional turmoil, must possess some anti-fragile uh, properties. But whatever I will say this morning uh, about our guest speaker will not do justice to the man who says he writes about probability with my entire soul and my entire experiences in the risk-taking business. I write with my scars. My thought is inseparable from autobiography. Professor Talib is currently professor of engineering at NYU. If asked what is his specialty, he will answer quant. That is a specialist in quantitative finance. Beneath the quants, however, you will find a philosopher of probability and an ethicist concerned about the implications of randomness on humanity. His latest book, Anti-Fragile, is the outcome of his experience in the real world, both on the trading floor and from studying the foundations of probability theory, especially the inevitability of rare events. Professor Talib's revealed brilliant mastery of the technicalities of probability theory of its deep philosophical implications while building pathways to smarter policies uh, for the ubiqu ubiquitous yet invisible uncertainty that is part and parcel of the world we live in. With no further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Talib. Hi, I'm extremely honored to be here at AUB and uh, you know, great company, and find it strange that an anti-intellectual who writes books and an anti-academic person who's a university professor, uh, that's Lebanese, that's very Lebanese, <laughs> very Lebanese straight. And anyway, one observation I want to make is that the only place in the Hellenistic world where uh, that was practical was Beirut. <laughs> The, it's the only place where people were complaining. When Libanios uh, Antiochus came to Beirut, he was shocked. He said, these guys, they're using Latin. Of course, the Beirut Law School. Because the Romans were anti-intellectual. They were engineers. They didn't like ideas and didn't like uh, theories. And liked, of course, liked to build systems that could handle disorder. And of course, we lost that. <coughs> with the intellectualization of the West that came after the West uh, development. So Beirut was effectively a Roman place until the earthquake and stayed the Roman place, <laughs> Romans versus Greek. And it was the only place that spoke Latin, by the way, that, that wrote in Latin, and the only place where people shaved their beard, by the way, also Beirut. Anyway, so anti-fragile, let me describe what I mean by anti-fragile. Uh, well, I was a trader for 22 years <laughs> while, while having some interests. And, and, and visibly, so I grew and even did my doctoral thesis, uh, you know, with some interruptions in my trading career. So I was very interested in, in volatility. That was my profession. Uh, how uh, systems, uh, how you benefit from volatility, some nonlinearity. And I observed one thing when I stopped trading. I looked at a coffee cup and uh, realized that this coffee cup has something in common with things that don't like volatility. In fact, it has a nonlinear uh, reaction to uh, shocks, so there's the same nonlinear reaction as volatility packages. And you can define fragility as effectively something that does not like uh, uh, variability, simply. If there's an earthquake, another one, we had one, the last one, I think the last major one was in the sixth century. If you have an earthquake, will this have any upside? No. Does it like mistakes? No. So it is fragile. So you can define the fragile mathematically as something that does not like mistakes and other things, has to have a nonlinear accelerated reaction up to the point of breaking uh, to shocks. Like a small shock 
has no impact. A large shock has much more impact, disproportionately large. And there are other things that we know from derivatives, like if the market goes down 10%, you lose vastly more money if you're exposed, negatively exposed to volatility than if it went down much more than 10 times 1%. So based on that, started building things. So meanwhile, so I was defining fragility when something hit me that the opposite of fragile, when you ask people the opposite of fragile, they give you some words, first of all, ill-defined, like resilient. You can't write it down mathematically. Or even more stupid word like robust that, in fact, don't describe systems that are the opposite. If you ask what's the opposite of fragile, they say solid, incassable, uh, the French, uh, in uh, Arabic. Uh, in Levantine, which is not Arabic, by the way, not a debate, or related to Arabic, but different language, different kind of Levantine means uh, the Levant's language, uh, and stuff like that. So it is visibly, this is a description of something that is, doesn't break, okay? So that's not the opposite of fragile. If I'm sending a package from here to southwestern Siberia, you write on it fragile. The opposite would be, you know, fragile means handled with care. The opposite would not be, uh, I don't really care, you can do whatever you want to it. The opposite of fragile would be, likes disorder, likes please, you know, shake me, I'll benefit from it. So there's a category of object like that. Without a word in the dictionary, but visibly the ancients knew about it. Because as you can see, and, and incidentally, I'm so proud to be in Beirut, you, what you have in the middle, is the solid and kasabl, ghayr khadi al kasr, all that nonsense. The things, it's basically you shoot it, you don't recognize, it's a symbol of Beirut. You shoot it, Phoenix, what happens to it, comes back the same. It doesn't care, just like people in Brooklyn. You know, they don't improve, they don't degrade, all right? So you can't do anything to, to make them worse, but definitely never improve. So that, actually, same thing with, I won't say the same thing with Beirut, but people from my village are immune. Nothing shakes them. Okay, so that's the symbol phoenix. To the left, Damocles, of course, that's a fragile. No upside from random event. It can be either neutral or negative. And of course, to the right, the anti-fragile. Do you recognize the animal? You kept one, it's like ISIS. You cut one head, what happens? Two grow back. All right, so the last thing you want is bother it. Okay, so it's a category of things that, 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 that react, overcompensate for some kind of shocks. For those of you in finance, this is a package that's fragile in time series, either small or no gain, and once in a while, horrible thing. All fragile objects have this characteristic, more upside than downside from random event. This is the robust, people from Amyun or Brooklyn, you know, they, you know, no, no, you know, nothing phases them, supposedly, and in theory. Uh, I'm not talking about physical uh, fragility, I'm talking about moral fragility, of course. And, uh, and of course, this is the category of object that has bigger upside than downside. Once you see this, you can mathematically do a lot of things. If you can start associating everything that came from disorder as having this characteristic, and we'll see how. Disorder brothers, and that is what's critical, and, and so it, I spent the last seven years thinking about it, and as uh, odds I will spend the next seven years, or, or 14 years, or 21 years, it goes by seven, so if it's, that's a Semitic uh, approach to things, um, is that if you gain from one, you gain from all of them. If you like one, you like all of them. Let's figure it out. We have a great physicist here. He will tell me why, if you like uncertainty, do you like time? Why, Ed, Eddie? Yeah. Because, sorry? No, 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 for physics it's time and, and, uh, and a randomness is the same thing, <laughs> you see? And anyway, is someone here in finance? Okay, you always have sigma, or in economics, you never have sigma without square root of time. You can have time without sigma, but never sigma without time, which is the scale of a random variable. So we start looking at things, you realize that if you like uncertainty, you like time. Because if you hate uncertainty, eventually the coffee cup, when in 2,000 years from now some guy will come here to talk about randomness, that coffee cup will be gone, no? Because it's fragile. So time will bring more random events. So time is accelerated variability or the reverse variability is accelerated time. 
The, uh, and of course, if you gain from error, because you have to be precise with a coffee cup, you don't have to be, you know, if you're not precise, it's going to break. So you can map things sensitivity to one to the other. Okay. Next thing is, I just now turned down an interview, I hate the press. And when I wrote a book called The Black Swan, it sold several million copies. <laughs> so the problem is, when you sell several million copies, you have three things. People who have never read the book talking about it. People reading other articles about the book, namely journalists, to write, okay, and then they buy the book, you know, for good measure, and look at the table of contents. So I made sure it made it impossible for anyone to figure out what my book was about from reading the table of content. <laughs> so the main central chapter is called On the Main Difference Between Your Cat and the Washing Machine. Okay, so you cannot figure out what, so, what it explains. But in fact, and that explains the main point. Okay, and then you made sure, and a lot of them were frustrated. Okay, some people started writing the negative review, I think page three. They, they, if they can't figure out, they want textbooks. And textbooks don't survive, by the way. You have to have some disorder in a book, or some kind of, uh, I would say, some kind of richness to the book. So, the, uh, what's the main difference between a cat and a washing machine? It's very simple. If you go hit, if you, uh, you know, bang on a cat, all right, uh, it may uh, get stronger, all right? But I don't know if you have tried to uh, bang on your washing machine. If you bang with your hand, on, it's not going to improve, no? So, and washing machine, when, when it breaks, it doesn't improve, you know, spontaneously, no? Okay, so everything organic and everything actually in a complex domain and how you define complexity, you can actually inverse engineer complexity as something that communicates with its environment via over overcompensation for stressors. Simple. You have a gym at AUB? Why do you have a gym at AUB? It so happened that a human body has a convex reaction to when you lift 100 pounds, uh, okay, it's better than a thousand times a tenth of a pound. <laughs> You have a nonlinear reaction, okay, and you go, you expose your body to a stressor, okay? A convex stressor. That's why people have gyms. Uh, I saw people jogging instead of walking. Why? But so if you jog, you gain, you, you, you're, you're, there's some health benefits from stressing your system because your system is made to communicate with the environment via stressors, not by reading uh, 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 by theory. So, so everything. Your, your skin, you go in the sun if you have Mediterranean skin. Again, Mediterranean, not Arab, all right? Mediterranean skin, all right? You, or Syrian skin, or something like that, you improve because it will overcompensate by coding for more sun, more exposure tomorrow, and a higher degree of exposure. So if you bang on something, all right, it will, your body will overcompensate by preparing for a larger shock, up to a point. And that's how complex systems uh, uh, communicate. The problem, of course, is, I said, the problem of mistaking the cat for a washing machine is people didn't understand uh, a fellow called Greenspan. At the time when I was writing the book, I had an obsessive disorder with Greenspan, whom I hated. He couldn't understand that the economy needed variation because if you don't have frequent small variation, you, have, you accumulate a lot of risk, big risks, and once you, you know, can't control it, it falls apart. And that's what happened. Um, <laughs> Uh, a forest, if you have frequent fires, if you let frequent fires take place in the forest, it cleans itself. If you don't let the forest have any fire, uh, the big one will be terminal because flammable material will accumulate and be 2D, exactly what happened with the economic crisis. And, and, and so uh, uh, one guy picked it up. It was too late. He was the governor of Bank of England. He picked it up. He realized uh, toward the end of his, uh, it was too late for him, <laughs> that you need that just like you have four seasons, uh, we have almost four seasons in Lebanon, you have four seasons in a lot of places, that the, the, the world needs seasons, <laughs> you see? So that if you don't have small seasons, some small variation, you're going to have a big one you can't control. So the big myth, of course, is not to realize that you don't like, you don't want to eliminate all variation. And that lowering risk doesn't come by lowering variability, but by increasing variability. And that's a big shock. When I wrote The Black Swan, I, I, I asked, that was 10 years ago, 
I went to Washington, well, I'm think I'm non grata now, because I call them charlatans for a reason, you can see. I went to the, uh, I forgot the name of the center. We had all these policy wonks. And I told them we have two countries, actually two sets of countries. One country had 40 governments, the other one had the same government and family uh, for the same 40 years. Which one is more stable? Now, in your opinion, which one is more stable? The one that had the 40 governments. Okay, at a the time, uh, they, said, they unanimously said, of course, the one that had one government is very stable. Uh, you know which country had one government. Okay, this is the one that we're talking about. I mentioned two countries, Syria and Saudi Arabia. So we're waiting for a second shoe to drop, okay? But the, 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 and the first one was Italy. And last time I checked, I don't know how I had, did anybody check on Italy today? Still around, no? Okay, then, okay. So, so there you go. So here you have a system that if you deprive a system from political disorder, bottom up, a lot of noise, okay, you, you fragilize it. And I just wrote a report now, went back to DC, I was hired by the RAND, I told, okay, on, on what I, you know, how do you measure country risk? It's exactly the reverse, okay? If you have variability, a thing didn't break, it means it's very stable, hence Lebanon. More on that later. So the biggest myth we've had, no, that's, um, is, uh, no, okay, this, this is better, okay? The biggest myth uh, we have had no, is believing, no, this is, anyway, this, this is the wrong slide, this one, okay. The biggest risk is believing that depriving children of uh, traumatic experiences is bad for them, it's good for them. So everybody talks about post-traumatic disorder, no? Has any one of you heard post-traumatic growth being mentioned? What do you think is the prevalence of post-traumatic growth in relation to post-traumatic disorder? One to one? Two to one? What do you think? One half to one? Sorry? It's about a hundred times, okay? Post-traumatic growth from experiences depend on the intensity of the experience. Actually, even not depending on the intensity of the experience. So basically, for every person with post-traumatic growth uh, disorder, 10 person had benefited from the experience. Myself, the war in Lebanon, everybody talks about trauma. <laughs> trauma, trauma, you know, is, uh, you know, look, I'm, uh, okay. And then the last, uh, we just had the longest living, uh, the oldest uh, human being today, you know where he is? Haifa, okay, in countries that cannot be mentioned. And he is a survivor of Auschwitz, okay? And we know, we think there's a direct link actually. Even very traumatic experiences extend your, your lifespan if you survive. Okay, that's conditional on surviving. So, but why don't people discuss post-traumatic disorder? Same reason why don't people discuss crises? Why don't people discuss it? Post-traumatic growth. Because nobody is ever going to make any money curing any one of you of post-traumatic growth. That's the problem. So people don't talk about it. That's what I call interventionism. So, and, and of course, the central mistake is to think that companies with very steady earnings are more stable in the long run. Typically, they're the ones to go bankrupt, okay? And, and exactly, if you want to predict, because typically companies that have a lot of subscription, steady earnings, governmental contracts, stuff like that, you can predict from the stability of the earnings the, the probability of bankruptcy, which is exactly the opposite of what everybody's trained to think. Okay, all right, next. Um, now, the meat. City states, the best way, if you want to have your country become rich, the first thing you do is you destroy all resources. I mean, if, I'm talking from an empiricist to look at history, because overcompensation is what made everything. So let's talk about our supposed ancestors, the Phoenicians. So I know you've heard of a country next, uh, not far called Cyprus. And incidentally, when people talk about the Arab world, go visit Cyprus and go visit Saudi Arabia and, uh, and look at who's closer and habits, s'mores and, uh, okay, anyway. So go to Cyprus, okay? They went to Cyprus and guess what? Cyprus is named after copper, right? They needed copper, it had nothing, almost nothing. So what happens when you go somewhere to bring something you don't, you don't have because you need it very badly? 
you have overcompensation. They figure out how to sail. And sure, sure enough, then you get more copper that you give the Egyptians, and then the Egyptians send you somewhere else to deliver something that you don't want to deliver, but you have to deliver because the Egyptians are powerful. They become friends with this, and you start having gold. So you become big sailors. And sure enough, you dominate the Mediterranean and transmit Semitic cultures, old Fertile Crescent cultures, all across the Mediterranean. Overcompensation. So basically, if you look at his history, look at today, the most successful countries have no resources. Singapore, there's another thing, scale. Same thing, Venice, the Hanseatic League, Amsterdam, London. Or right, London has some resources, but still, the, the, the idea is turning water into gold. And you look at it, the place in the, in, in the Middle East, which is we're in the Near East, the Middle East that is the most uh, livable is Dubai that has no resources. The only place <laughs> that doesn't have oil, no? Okay, so there you go. Now you understand that overcompensation is present in economic systems. So, uh, and actually, even then, they say if uh, having a small error rate, we're going to see what under what condition an error rate is favorable, is not favorable. Um, Things that have a small error protects them from large errors. So, if that concept works, what do you do? Have you heard of Netflix? You make your own mistakes. You're not making enough mistakes naturally. You, so Netflix has something called the Chaos Monkey that, makes, uh, that, that goes in, hacks their system continuously, or cause, makes mistakes to see how the system reacts to mistakes. And overcompensation, of course, is the way they are completely unhackable, completely breakable, because they're going to figure out how the thing breaks by themselves by accelerating time, subject themselves to accelerated time, to see also how things react to disorder, to shocks, and overcompensate, you've heard of Silicon Valley and the crisis of 2000. Everything that happened subsequent to the crisis of 2000 was an improvement. Okay, so systems definitely, now we realize economic system, they don't grow uh, from top down. Uh, thinkers would decide that they should grow because someone wrote some paper on growth. No, they react to errors and mistakes. We're going to more of that. Now, the first thing. So I'm going to start. I'm going to go back to the physics of fragility. So the physics of fragility. There is. This is a biblical thing, and actually not biblical. Uh, again, it's written in a language, Semitic language that I won't mention. A story of a king who had a son who was very mischievous, and the son needed to be punished. And I don't know if you've been a king or have a son, but it's very difficult. The punishment being that you've got to crush the person with that stone. All right. So how do you think he handled it? He had an advisor okay, who came. And what did the advisor recommend? You crush this big stone into small pebbles. You have a lot of coffee, because it takes a lot of time. And then you dump the pebbles on the head of that sun. Okay? So here we have, we save the son, of course, maintained his status as impartial king, and discovered the law of fragility. That you are fragile if you're harmed more by 20 kilos hitting your head than 20 times one kilo. <laughs> okay, that's it. So you have to have some accelerated, uh, uh, some accelerated reaction to uh, the, the the harm, you are fragile, up to the point of breaking, of course, we'll see in a few minutes. So the, 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 the convexity effect is necessary in anything that's fragile that has survived. Uh, if I jump 10 meters, even in Beirut, uh, I, I, I would die. I mean, not a bad place to die, but I have no incentive now. Uh, but it's much more harm than 100 times 10 centimeters or 1,000 times 1 centimeter. Why? Because if it were linear to harm, I'd, have, I'd be dead, you see? So things are either dead or alive, nothing in between. The distribution of hum half humans is not uh, very prevalent. So you have that effect comes from acceleration. So let me explain quickly what the, 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 the idea of convexity and why you like disorder. If you uh, give a lung ventilator to patients, give the same, temper, as, as the same uh, intensity, they die. If you vary the intensity half 
one and a half, half one and a half, they survive. So visibly, there's a convex reaction. You see already that convex reaction? We're going to see more of it. Everything that's convex likes variability, rather than, and everything that's concave hates variability. Let's take the concave. In Fahrenheit, you have a grandmother, and you have the information that you spent uh, two days at 70 degrees on average. You think it's a good thing, no? 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's about what, 22 degrees, 20 degrees, 18 degrees? OK. It's very good, no? And what is the second piece of information that one day was at uh, zero and uh, Fahrenheit, OK, and which was minus 20? And the second one is at uh, 140 degrees, which is what, about 60? OK, so you realize that it's not as good. OK, so everything that doesn't like variability is, has its concave reaction. <laughs> That's it. So in that phase, we'll have convex reaction. OK, so and, and, and you can have a general rule that everything that likes variability has to have a convex payoff. In other words, if the market goes up $10, I make 10 times more than one up $1. Or conversely, it went up ten dollars. I, I make more than I would lose if it went down ten dollars. If you have that reaction, you are anti-fragile for that portion, and conversely for the fragile. Okay, and and one way to view it is the convex is good, concave is bad. But the best way to remember it is this way. Okay, <laughs> you like variability, you don't like variability. And this is a coffee. Co the, so in medicine, you have the S curve. <laughs> There's something I call the generalized S curve. Like you have saturation, or you can go back down. You see the idea. It's like uh, if you go to the saturation, it's like a weekend in Tripoli, all right, is good. Two weekends in Tripoli is vastly worse. So it degrades. You see, worse than nothing. But one weekend is better than two weeks. You get it than nothing. So you see, you go up. So you generalize the S curve. Whatever you see, the curve is convex. You want variability. So, in other words, we understand now why diabetes comes from lack of variability in feeding. We're made from episodic famine. Uh, 40 days once in a while. Uh, Ramadan came to compensate. Same thing for uh, the Orthodox uh, fast to prevent you from having protein for 200 days a year. So all these things, from, uh, you know, because steady supply, as you read in textbooks, uh, unfortunately, doesn't map to reality. Okay? Uh, you have to have some, in that phase, you have to have some variability. So in other words, uh, intermittent fasting is vastly better. Actually, you can cure, I'm saying not, not, get, not mitigate, but cure diabetes with intermittent fasting. And we're made, why? Because we're matched, the statistical property in the environment is <laughs> require intermittent fasting. Likewise, we're made to be part cow, part lion. So if you're going to be deprived of something, meat we used to have in lumps. If you have steady meat, you burn your kidneys. If you have lumpy meats, you have time to recover. So it's a lot better for you to have lumpy meat and study grass. OK, boring stuff like tabbouli and the good things like lahm uh, mishwi. So, so the, 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 actually, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Mediterranean used to only eat meat during sacrifice days. So, and we're establishing that via the Orthodox fast. Don't tell anybody I'm not fasting today, but um, you, today is an orthodox fast where you're vegan, reestablishing that. So anyway, so you realize that we can map everything using the same concept of liking disorder in a phase that's convex, disliking disorder in a phase that is concave. So up to, say, uh, uh, 48 hours, it's good to starve, but not beyond, because then you, you're not in that phase, that phase anymore. So anyway, so another thing about political systems as I went back to the idea of systems top-down versus bottom-up with the story of the souk and the office building. Okay? The wealthiest part of the world for a long time was that stretch from Aleppo to Antioch to, uh, actually, Baalbek was built by them to Homs, Emesa, which, you know, four Roman emperors, 17 uh, Greek authors, uh, 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 Steve Jobs, that, that part of the world. And the state very rich, much richer than any part of the Ottoman Empire, up until when? Up until, have you heard of the French, like La France, this, that country? Up till that country came to the area with the establishment of something called nation state. Have you heard of nation state? Flags, things, administration, top down, bureaus, all that. OK. So you realize they killed. And then people came and uh, you know, went to Sorbonne. 
usually like me, Greek Orthodox Christians, come back with the idea of state. What are we going to do with the souk? So we transformed so in the anti-fragile discuss the difference between the souk and the office building. With the too much disorder in the souk, we're going to do that. Everything's going to be run out of Damascus. And you know the rest of the story. So the enemy of the area was a bath, <laughs> and it was so-called Arab socialism, much more than anything else, because it pretty much destroyed the structure that was working, in the, you know, OK, replaced it by something that wasn't even working in the West. OK? So even in the West, because if you look at the history of France, it came from disorder, and the minute they bureaucratized much after they bureaucratized Syria, OK? So the, the, that idea of the transfer from the souk to the office building to an organized economy is what wrecks Syria. And effectively, Lebanon had the same GDP as Syria, actually a little lower than northern Syria. And uh, today, uh, before the war, it was something like four or five times more GDP for Lebanon than Syria. Why? Because in Lebanon, we were lucky that our state was, much, uh, was weak. That's because we, the state was weak that we developed. So in spite of so the state here, nobody took it seriously. So we always had mechanism to go outside the state. Anyway, so the, there's something. So within the anti-fragile, you know, there are a lot of technical papers associated with anti-fragile, including a, a free book called The Mathematical Theory of Fragility. So there are a lot of things. The first one is the notion of scale. The, the problem is when we compare political systems, people fail to understand that what matters isn't so much the genre of political system or the color, but the scale, the size. Why? Because we have scale transformation. The, 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 in, in, in the Levant, there's a notion of public. There's no notion of public, but there's a notion of private, and there's something called semi-public that uh, Ostrom, the, the, the lady who got uh, the Bank of Sweden prize in honor of Alfred Nobel, um, pick it up, there's something intermediate, you know, it's a small community. The community works, what, uh, hence decentralization, but the state doesn't work because the public is too abstract a concept for the people. Likewise, Singapore works. It has the same uh, political system as China. But I don't know how many of you would prefer to live in China than Singapore, okay? The GDP, the ratio is monstrously, obscenely, you know, it's like 60,000 uh, versus uh, you're a few thousands, OK? So wh why? Because same idea of fragility when things collapse. A mouse is vastly less fragile than an elephant. An elephant breaks a leg very quickly, because, but an elephant is vastly more efficient than a mouse. But I don't know if you've, you've heard of the mammoth. They go extinct. Large animals go extinct. The, the elephants, they're about to go extinct. And we have more, I'm sure, I'm sure we have more mice in Beirut than we have elephants in the world. OK, so this is, uh, I mean, the, the, we have probably more, more mice in a building in New York. I mean, no, I'm kidding, we have 30, 40,000 elephants. So, so you realize that when you scale up, and who picked it up? The Bible, of course, the Tower of Babel. As you go up, you have a nonlinear fragility, so a big tower is going to be much more fragile than equivalent in houses. But let me stay here a little bit, OK? That the system here was never a system in a nation state top down. It was a municipal system. Beirut was its own thing. Under the Ottoman Empire, it's like you work under Mafia Dawn. And it works. City state as a format is, has been vastly more successful than a system of top down state. And someone who gave me a recently Italy as a counterexample doesn't understand the history of Italy, that the big wars in Italy would kill 600 to 800 people. The first war came after unification of Italy into a big state, assuming that you were really unified, 680,000 people died in the first war. And the GDP of, uh, comparative GDP of Italy went down after unification relative to other parts of Europe. So the city-state under a big uh, empire, Pax Romana, Pax Ottomana, now Pax Americana, Pax Europeana, Pax Habsburgiana, works vastly better, the municipal body, municipal system. That's how the Levant was organized, vastly better. So, so now we know that from history, OK? We also know from project size, we have evidence mathematically and empirically. Simple one, take project size. A 100 million pound project in the UK 
had 30% more cost overruns than a 10 million plant project. So whatever economies of scale you think you're having, you lose them in DC economies, stochastic DC economies because of con uh, co <coughs> accelerated losses from errors. It also explains why cities that are, you heard of downtown Beirut, okay? Uh, how busy are the restaurants in downtown Beirut? Organized top down, okay. Someone before downtown Beirut should have visited Brasilia, all right, to see how constructed things work. Where is the action? Monod uh, in the Bohemian parts. Uh, it's the same thing like in Athens, the Psiri of uh, Beirut. Uh, yesterday we went to uh, Malam Khail. So, so this is where the action is. Think spontaneously. That would change Jacobs. It's a top down structures. They look nice. They're neat, but they're not made for humans. Humans don't like them. Humans like the mess of narrow streets and stuff like that. That's evidenced by uh, real estate prices. Whatever Hausman did for Paris is much cheaper in real estate than what it, parts he left intact. <laughs> like Saint-Germain, Saint-Quem in Paris, much more expensive real estate than the big boulevard, okay? So it's the same thing, you should have read anything about Jane Jacobs before doing that downtown, big monstrous project, rather than let things organically recover on their own as, as they have and migrate in, in other areas. So, so uh, and then, of course, France. People say France is a success story of a top-down state thing. Unfortunately, that's not what the history of France shows. France has 500 cheeses, ungovernable, and was much more implanted in North Africa than it was in France itself, as witnessed by, uh, before Ferry did the Education Nationale, it took a long time to bureaucratize France. France is a wild place. And, and with a lot of languages. And in the first war, only 15% of soldiers could understand, not speak French. They learned a little bit at school that they forgot, sort of like classical Arabic for a Syriac speaking person or some, in, in northern Syria. So anyway, so this is so far called the scaling effect. And one consequence of this is how people get organized ethnically and uh, religiously. From studies by uh, uh, a colleague of mine, and Bariam, and I'm doing some work with him on scaling for hopefully for to save Syria, is um, it's the fact that people are much better roommates, uh, worse roommates than they are neighbors, because they don't want to be governed. If you're Shiite, you don't want to be governed by Sunni. If you're Sunni, you don't want to be governed by Shiite. It's very simple. Then you give each one of them, you know, your, this is your building, this is your building, or this is your municipality. And people get along. <laughs> they start getting along the minute you have decentralization. And we know that from Switzerland, how there's no tension when, when the areas were they're excellent neighbors. We have a river, excellent neighbors. And when people start getting mixes, when they had tensions in the history of Switzerland. And then you can uh, translate that to a lot of places. That way people feel that they're not being governed by some central government that is they don't trust. Or of a different, like Iraq was governed by one sect and now another sect. That will never, never work that way. <laughs> you can still have countries, flags, whatever you want, but so long as people don't feel that someone controls their religious uh, decision making. Okay, so in America we only have one few areas like where the Amish can survive, but that's a generalized method, it works very well. Laka dina kwalidini, laka, this is your area, you can do whatever you want. It's the same thing from decentralization, notions of scale that we can express this way. Um, and of course, notion of scale, uh, I don't know if you know that companies go uh, by merging, commit suicide. And I don't know if you know the success of Germany. People think that Germany, a lot of people think that Germany is one country. Uh, Germany never really unified because the first time unified on the Bismarck, you know what they did to France, the poor French. And the second time they unified under another guy, you know what they did. So when the Allies invaded Germany, what did they do? They decentralized the place. Why? They said, we don't want Berlin to come back with big ideas, okay? They, 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 they didn't forecast Merkel. So, so they made sure that the thing was as decentralized as possible. And when you're very decentralized, you don't have large corporations leeching off the state. So it's very broken, broken up. And the big success of Germany is like Switzerland, a completely bottom-up country, almost like Switzerland, completely bottom-up. The most successful country in history is a country where people don't know the government. There's, the central government is cosmetic, except for the army. 
and they don't have, they haven't had many wars, you know, haven't, you know, haven't heard of a war they've been involved in recently. So very, very decentralized. It's bottom-up municipal Switzerland, and that's a stable system. What's a strange thing is all these refugees go, all these Syrians go to Switzerland because it's a safe place, not realizing that it's a safe place because it's decentralized. There's something in people's logic. In an in in anti-fragile essay, how Lenin went there, and, the, and nobody understood that why they were going to Switzerland, not some other country. Because it's decentralized, things work better because you have noise. Distributed mistakes. By distributing mistakes, you make a system more stable. So um, now the philosoph philosopher's stone. Let's talk about innovation. Let's, uh, uh, so I'm going to discuss that idea of, um, that I call that, what do universities do? do the, the, there are a lot of things that they do right, but a lot of things that they um, are involved in, in intellectualizing things, I call it lecturing birds how to fly. If you lecture birds how to fly, the birds are going to fly, no? So you, but given that birds don't write books, you'll never know whether the birds learn flying from lect the lectures or whether the lectures were just uh, doing something called epiphenomenal. So let's see some more. What is this object here? Wheel. When was it discovered? Like everything, pretty much in the Fertile Crescent, but actually not quite the Fertile Crescent. It might have been uh, Anatolia. But okay, let's cheat a little bit. Okay, how many years ago? Six thousand years. Okay, let's say six thousand years. Why did it take six thousand years for this implementation? Okay. I remember when, when I left Lebanon, we were so nobody had the idea. Okay, all right. So why is it so? Okay, so let's continue. Pyramids uh, in Mexico built how? They didn't have the wheel. Is it true they didn't have the wheel? No. They had it, but they used it for children's toys. They didn't, weren't able to connect. Steve Gates, uh, not Steve Gates, Steve uh, Jobs uh, said something about uh, you can look at the technology, all right, and you'll never figure out what's been used for. The, the, the difficult part is using an existing technology for an implementation. So let's take now the steam engine. Everybody had maps. Of, we know how to make steam engines in Hero of Alexandria. That was a Greek way. But the implementation didn't happen till the Industrial Revolution. By people rediscovering it, they're completely illiterate. So this is what I, the, the big problem now is what the problem is that is this, um, how do we probe uncertainty? We probe uncertainty by trial and error, which is basically the same thing. You make small mistakes, and the more mistakes you make in general, the better off you are. Like countries, if, by the way, if you want to figure out the health of a country, count the rate of bankruptcies. The rate of bankruptcies in a place described is proportional to uh, economic growth. Maybe not this direct local variation, but is the highest rate of bankruptcy in the world is in California, and beside that, the highest rate of bankruptcy in the world is in the United States. Okay, you have a very low rate of bankruptcy, you won't have growth. It means people are trying because you probe uncertainty. There are two ways to probe uncertainty. I'm sure that we we. The, the way to probe uncertainty, the one way was trial and error. So let's make, uh, have a thought experiment. You go bring, um, there's, you have a, a chemistry department at AUB that's very prominent. You go bring all the chemists, you take them to Faraya to a retreat, you feed them well, and you give them a blackboard to invent the best molukhiye recipe, okay? It's okay, so that's a top-down approach, techne, uh, episteme, epi episteme uh, epistemic approach. Uh, they're going to get some resim you no? Know? The other technique is much cheaper, is you go into a kitchen, you take an existing recipe, and you add something to it randomly, right? And you taste. If it's good, you ratchet up. So all you have to know is figure out if it's better than what you had before. If it's worse, you give it to your mother-in-law. I'm sure you know she'd be delighted. Okay. So, so what happens? So, small cost of trial, and you keep going. Five minutes. Okay. So, this is the model of um, of uh, of trial and error, and you can easily safely calculate that much better if you to be as you know smart as someone doing trial and error. You have to have a thousand IQ points. <laughs> 
If you to avoid trial and error, just go by directed knowledge, top down. Of course, the combination works, but it works best with, have you heard of something called pharma? Now, pharma is a business that benefited immensely from luck. Why? Well, first of all, it all started with trial and error, and actually now the, the growth has degraded monstrously since we have biological understanding of the mechanism, so it blinds you to trial and error. So that's the idea. Uh, the more trial and error, the more you're milking disorder, because you probe lack of knowledge by having small losses, small gain. And, and of course, there's almost no drug today, except for a few AZT drugs, that's not here because of a mistake. I mentioned uh, something that, that nobody had heard of uh, called Viagra, for example. It was a mistake, all right? But there are other things that were mistakes, and, and aspirin was a mistake. Aspirin was introduced as a uh, fever uh, you know, reducer and, and later on uh, migrated to be a, uh, a painkiller and now it's a blood thinner. Okay? So side effects of something that benefits from its own mistakes, a side effect, okay, is something that knows how to probe disorder properly. Why? Because you're convex to error. Because convex it means an error costs you very little when you're wrong and uh, makes you a lot when you're right. So this is pretty much the model. I'm almost finished. I don't know how to use this computer. Um, the, the, the. So, so pretty much I'm done with, um, with uh, so there's a sign called stop. OK. Let me wrap up here very quickly on my whole talk. So there are two ways to approach the world. One way that's purely intellectual. The other one is use a disorder, okay, and benefit like complex system do from the disorder. Of course, there's a combination, but the combination best used when you have rational uh, ratcheting up. You know what's better, okay, so you lock yourself up to that state. Um, I don't know if evolution, you've heard something called evolution. It's accepted in AUB. I, th I thought there was uh, one of my great uncles, uh, when someone graduated here in 1884 from medical school, I think they had trouble with evolution at the time. Okay, so what does evolution do? Evolution is benefits from randomness because you produce a lot of offspring, okay, and the variation in the environment you select. So the more you have randomness in the environment up to a point, the, the, or, or sometimes you have your own uh, genetic uh, drift or mis mistakes in the DNA. So if you have a high rate of mistake, it's not going to work. If you have a small rate of mistake, it's going to work, you see, because if you have a high rate of mistake, you don't retain your benefits. So anyway, I'm summarizing here a framework to look at things mathematically and formally of things that are under a unifying way, convex or concave response, local convex, local concave, maybe global something else, and how to benefit from randomness. Now, back to me, I grew up in Beirut. And basically, a lot of people say, what do we learn from being Lebanese? Okay, okay we learn to make kibbe, that's very interesting. We learned to have a big ego that our ancestors invented everything. That's also interesting. But mostly what we learn here is to how to deal with mess. Okay, how to survive mess, how to survive disorder, how to survive things. Okay, how to deal with, with variation, how to deal with variety, how to deal with people who have different way of view in the world. Okay, and, and different way, different religion, different things. So you, you learn that kind of stuff. And mostly, uh, I went through the war through disorder. So I think that 99% of what I've done has been greatly motivated by the stressors of the war, and I was convinced that it was not bad for me. Deep down, I convinced that it was not bad for me. Uh, the motivation of, uh, of that. So basically, that's what we've picked up from Lebanon. It's not the alphabet of this. It's basically our prime material is how to handle disorder. Thank you for inviting me.